thanks for stopping by the channel. Make sure you are subscribed and you're checking out the bell icon down there so that you're getting notifications. And like, comment over here. Like, comment, and share. Uh, I am thrilled, actually, and humbled to have Chris Wiley with me today. Uh, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar, and if you're not familiar, that then you will be. Uh, Chris is a, a theologian and a philosopher and an author, and I think you have what fourteen different books that you're working on <laughs> right now. I'm like you're 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 working on some Tolkien stuff. You're working on some young adult fiction, and now you're working on some something with uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Lovecraft and Lewis at the same time. Right. Yeah. You're yeah. trying to get alienated and isolated from every community. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, thanks for coming on. Tell me a little bit about your writing projects. Yeah, thanks, TC. Um, well, I just finished up a book on Tom Bombadil that I'm told will come out any time now. And, of course, that's kind of a Tolkien project. I'm uh, working on a couple of uh, books for kids, fiction. Um, I have a young adult series, and I have the second book that I'm just about done with. I was just working on it this morning. And then I'm working kind of on and off again on a children's picture book. And uh, I, the, I'm the illustrator for it and obviously the author for it. And then the project you just described, uh, the Lovecraft Lewis thing. Years ago, I wrote a piece for Touchstone Magazine on Lewis and Lovecraft, and it went over pretty well in both the fan bases, both the Lovecraft world and the Lewis world. And it seemed to me that it provided an opportunity to do some cultural apologetics. Uh, it's really, you have uh, with Lewis and Lovecraft a number of remarkable uh, sort of parallels, yeah. uh, but you also have some important distinctions, especially when it comes to cosmology. So, yeah. so and, and then there, there are different understandings of the cosmos um, lead to different ways of thinking about evil and monsters and things like that. And that is really quite uh, relevant for us in our world. And so I thought it'd be worthwhile doing a, a book, writing a book on Lewis and Lovecraft. I don't have a publisher or anything yet. I'm just in the very early stages of kind of thinking about that project. I have a, like I said, I've got these other projects I need to get behind me first. <laughs> you, I start a lot of writing projects and never finish them, so I'm probably <laughs> need to do what you what you do. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask this, get this out of the way. So you just here a few weeks ago attended the PCA General Assembly, right? And um, having read and listened to you now for a few years, uh, I I know that you tend to have a very uh, a very sharp um, take, and not in a negative way, on on the on the culture, and oftentimes in the way the church is being permeated by the culture. And what's your takeaway as you walk in, in a in a fifty thousand foot overview of the general assembly this year? What's what's your take on the on the culture and the direction the PCA is is headed right now? Do you do you see do you do you see a schism coming or? Well, that, that well, it's hard to say. I mean, um, the uh, assembly this year was a marvelous corrective to the assembly in Dallas two years ago. Uh, at the end of that assembly, and I was there for that, uh, I had very bad feelings coming away from that assembly, and I was sure we were heading to a schism. Um, but uh, something happened between that assembly and this assembly that I don't think we expected to see. And I, uh, I give COVID the credit in God's providence for what happened. Um, and here's why. Uh, we didn't meet la uh, last year for the assembly um, because of COVID. What that meant uh, is that the conservatives, who generally speaking are in more rural and sort of traditional areas, um, had extra time to organize and raise funds and show up in mass to this year's assembly. I don't know if that could have happened with just a year's time, you know, to prepare. But with two years, we had a lot of we had a we had a far larger uh, representation by ruling elders, for example, 
uh, and ruling elders from, you know, churches that never come to General Assembly or never send anybody to General Assembly. So we had a very different sort of mix at St. Louis than we had at Dallas. Furthermore, I think that the COVID stuff really hit the National Partnership churches hard. Uh, so the more progressive element of the, or sort of wing of the PCA, some of those churches have not met at all since the whole COVID thing, you know, at, you know, and the restrictions on worship and so forth uh, were put in place. So a lot of the conservatives, you know, have been working hard to meet as much as they can. Uh, some have completely ignored uh, COVID restrictions and have just gone ahead and done their thing. Yeah. And those churches have done pretty well in the past year. They've actually grown. I think there's been a COVID bump for a lot of uh, conservative churches because they've just simply been meeting in mega churches and seeker sensitive churches and woke churches just have not been meeting. So people who were already kind of disgruntled with those places um, just decided to make, a sh make the shift and come over to churches that were actually worshiping and meeting. And so I think uh, there was a twofold sort of uh, dynamic with COVID. One of the things I just described was we had uh, a lot more conservative sort of uh, kind of heartland uh, PCA ruling elder types and even teaching elder types who came out to this assembly precisely because they wanted to make sure that they were there for the votes on the overtures related to homosexuality and so forth. But also the, the, the guys in the big cities and the cool churches and the whole RUF kind of network, they were underrepresented this time. There were, there were, there were, le there were fewer of those guys there than there were at Dallas. I find it, uh, <clears throat> Very encouraging to hear you say that. Like I, as I said it when we were doing pre-recording, I, I reform Calvinistic Baptist going to a Presbyterian church, a PCA of all things, and uh, and and watching because I've had struggles. It's it's virtually impossible for me to find a a, a genuinely reformed Baptist church within you know a decent drive time for me uh, without you know driving you know three to four hours sometimes. <coughs> Um, so where so, so where are you, TC? I'm down in the southeast corner of Minnesota. Oh, okay, sure, sure. So, yep. so I'm virtually in Iowa. You know, most people think I am in Iowa, but I'm another 20 miles away from there. But um, so uh, it's been interesting for me, and I watched the Revoice um, fiasco build, and was actually taken aback from two years ago when there wasn't a, a, a resounding stifling of that particular wing of the of the PCA and I find it terribly ironic that this year it was in St. Louis which was of course yeah. home to the to the revoice um, fiasco and and it sounds like you guys maybe put that down pretty well yeah we'll see hopefully it's not a Pyrrhic victory or something like that yeah. um, I think one of the problems that we're going to face is just follow through, you know, now that the overture, uh, overtures have been, you know, sent to the presbyteries, there's just a, you know, a, a, a sort of the, the, the work of following through. And one of the troubles, one of the problems that conservatives have always had in the, you know, Protestant world for time out of mind is uh, staying on task because generally speaking, conservatives just kind of want to tend their own gardens and mind yep. their own business. And, yep. um, Consequently, when the crisis uh, passes, they go back to normal. And and this is one of the things that makes them great. I mean, I, I, it's one of the thing, aspects of conservatism that I think is marvelous. It's a mind your own business kind of outlook and just do what's right and, uh, and do what makes sense and do what, you know, is traditionally proven to be sound, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, whereas progressives uh, generally uh, are ensconced in bureaucracies, they're activists by nature, uh, they live for this kind of stuff. They, they're always strategizing, they're always planning, they're always communicating, they're always showing up uh, at the worst possible moments in mass. Uh, when I was in Dallas, 
um, you know, there were there were a number of conservatives who going into that General Assembly felt like we had done our work. Um, there were a number of things that, you know, uh, you could be encouraged about. There were people on ballots that uh, if they had been elected would have been, been you know, uh, a great voice. Uh, great, you know, would have provided voices to, uh, that that were corrective in nature, mm. but they, but we were completely um, outclassed and outmaneuvered in Dallas, and you could just feel it. The sort of the glee, you could hear it, you, the glee, you know, on the floor of the presbytery uh, at certain points from the the national partnership and the progressive wing of the church. And, and that's why a number of people left. That's why this whole Vanguard Presbytery thing kind of got rolling along. And we saw a number of guys, small number, but some, some good guys leave the PCA over that assembly. And I thought the, the National Partnership had all the momentum at that point. Like I said, it was the COVID thing that I think completely caught them by surprise. And they... they uh... Anyway, I, it's, it's a different story now, but hopefully... Hopefully, yeah. um, something positive will stick from this assembly. Yeah, it's a definitely a different story than what, what you hear coming out of the Southern Baptist Convention, even again yeah. this year, where, you know, maybe some strides made in, in, in awareness, but definitely no strides made in leadership. In fact, if it could have gotten worse for the Southern Baptist Convention, if you especially if you listen to the guys from Sword in the Trowel, you know, um, Right. Longshore and uh, uh, Askel. Like, right. I don't I don't know that that you could have gotten worse outside of maybe just a, like a radical Marxist who then plagiarized somebody else's sermon. Right. So right. and, and yeah, so that, I I you know, I I'm over here watching like. I was like ready for a schism in the PCA and yeah. not, not anticipating it in a positive light, but saying like, there's a fight coming. And, and so I'm actually encouraged to hear you say that because I haven't gotten a lot of feedback from a lot of people. It's, the, the, the Baptists are a lot different than the Presbyterians. The Presbyterians always play everything really close to the vest. They don't want to ever, they don't, they don't air their dirty laundry. The Baptists, they, they can't get to a microphone fast enough. So <laughs> I uh, I think this is actually a really good segue to to talk a little bit about in and, and I don't throw this out there lightly. I think maybe one of the most pivotal books in my life as a Christian was your book, uh, The Household and the War for the Cosmos. Oh wow! And it and I think it's because it resonated with me. I I can even tell you where I I went through. Now I read oftentimes by listening. And um, because I do a lot of busy work and I do a lot of landscaping and stuff in the summer. And it was a, just a couple of years ago, I was sitting on a lawnmower <laughs> at my daughter and my son-in-law's place, listening to your reading um, for the first time, uh, the household and war for the cosmos and, and saying, wow, this, this resonates with me. This is why all of these things are so important to me. And this is pre-COVID, pre-COVID. Right, right, right. And as, it, because I've been seeing these things, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a, a, a Schaefer nut. I'm not an official, you know, like, sure. I, I don't know everything, but I'm kind of, I, I love Schaefer and Schaefer resonates with me. And, and I would imagine you probably have read yeah. much of his stuff. And <coughs> I've, and I'm like, okay, now I understand why Schaefer resonates with me. And and I don't feel so out there and alone. And then I came across your book and I was like, holy crow, I'm not crazy. This is historic. <laughs> right, right. Um, the thing that, a couple of the things about that, and, I, and I'd kind of like to see how you came, do you have this intersection, not to use the, the, no, I understand. But you have this intersection that you talk an awful lot about in the in the course of the book. And I would like for you to kind of give the people who will hear this a little bit of a teaser about these two characters that run throughout the history of the world that keep, they keep intersecting in their history. Uh, how did you come up with that? Where did you how did you 
discover it? What did you see it on your own? Yeah, you're thinking about Aeneas and Abraham. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> well, um, I think that um, the importance of Aeneas uh, to Christians in the first century is one of these open secrets. I don't. I don't see how people really can miss it. Uh, with in 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 a, in a way because, well, for example, I'm just I'm rereading Augustine's City of God right now, and he starts the whole thing off talking about Aeneas, <laughs> and uh, and so within the the uh, within the world of you know you know antiquity in the first century in particular, uh, Aeneas looms very large, and you know right in Acts. It's a chapter, a chapter, I think it's chapter 10, where there's a healing of a character named Aeneas. Yeah. Yeah, it's right after the conversion of the Apostle Paul. We segue back to Peter, and then we have a series of things that occur before, uh, you know, Peter goes to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius, of course, is a Roman centurion. Um, but there are these events which signal uh, that the Christian faith the gospel is about to enter the empire and transform it and one of the things that signals this is the healing of aeneas this character who can't walk now that's ironic uh and everybody who heard the book of acts read aloud in the churches in the first and second century would have gotten it gotten the joke it would have been like saying there was a guy named george washington <laughs> you know, if, if, if for Americans, you know, everybody understood the importance of Aeneas. Aeneas was believed to be the the progenitor, the, the 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 person through whom the Roman people came into being. He was the father of the Roman people, and uh, he uh, uh, his story was told by Virgil in the Aeneid. Uh, and in that story, uh, Aeneas flees Troy. It's you know, Troy has been sacked by the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, as he flees, he carries his father Anchises on his back because his father is, is a cripple. So he's, he's carrying his father out of the city and he has his son Ilius by the hand. And then in the other hand, he's got his sword. So it's a beautiful picture of three generations. And, and it's, a, it's an image of piety. In the first century, pius, the Latin word that we translate into the English word piety, meant devotion to duty. And it meant duty not only to the gods, but to your father, to your children, to your household. So for um, people in the first century, there was no sort of like uh, division between uh, your responsibilities to your household and family and your responsibility to the ancestors or the and your responsibility to the gods so this is the background <clears throat> and um when aeneas is cured by peter in acts 10 uh the, what is being said is that the empire is crippled and christ is going to heal it and so aeneas takes his bed and walks and that's the sign uh again this is ironic because in the story of the aeneid uh aeneas uh is this virile man great warrior who's carrying his father on his back but now he can't walk that's the joke aeneas can't yep. walk now i believe that aeneas in this particular episode in acts is a real historical person named aeneas but it's i think communicating the story is communicating on two levels now getting back to abraham aeneas uh the roman people believed that they were the heirs of the world that they were called to govern the world justly and to be the ruling people well it just so happened that there was another group of people called uh jews who felt the same way <laughs> they had a, a founding father named abraham Conflict is looming. That's right. That's right. And the heir of Abraham, the heir who is the heir of the world, is guess who? The Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the first century, there is this clash, this conflict of, this, uh, of, of cosmologies and visions. 
And, uh, you know, the Caesars were believed to be sons of the gods, and they were believed to be seated in heavenly places with the gods. We actually have uh, artifacts from the first century that depict Augustus in heavenly places surrounded by the gods. And so when Paul in Ephesians says, Christ has ascended on high as seated in heavenly places, uh, it's a direct uh, assertion that Caesar is not God, Jesus is God, and that the empire will eventually uh, become the possession of the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact, even as it is in truth, because he's already ascended on high. So this is the background uh, in which, you know, the Christians in the first centuries of the church were, were doing their evangelistic work. They were uh, making some pretty bold claims that were considered very uh, well, threatening to the established powers. Yeah, they were uh, uh, they were insurrectionists, for lack of better terminology, right. Right. just because of their rejection of the the Roman Empire and the Roman emperors as deity. Right. They didn't care who you worshipped <laughs> at all. You could worship whoever you wanted, but you also had to acknowledge Rome right. and acknowledge Caesar as as Lord. Right, in that's a right. deific way. Um, I love. I like that you clarified that you see Aeneas both as a historical figure and also as a a, a symbol of what mm -hmm. is to come, because I think what we see a lot, and 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 if if you disagree, I please tell me. But what I think what we see a lot, especially in in modern Western Christian culture, is either an overemphasis on everything is just symbolic and we approach it from an emotional perspective of i feel this way about the symbiology that's here or everything has to be taken only literally and and therefore that what happened to aeneas has no other meaning than jesus was performing a miracle and now this guy's healed and he gets up and walks away and we hear that I, outside of what you said in the book I had never heard that before. I had never heard that before. Yeah, I think that we have a sub-Christian view of the sort of history and its relationship to eternal matters. So um, you and I are both at one and the same moment individuals yep. and the images of God. It's not an either or situation. Right. It's a both and situation. So as we look at human history, we can see things that are going on that are, you know, un are things that can be understood uh, sort of historically and contingently. And at the same time, we can say, well, these are also things that point to, you know, larger realities and point to and reflect, you know, God's providential ordering of things. And so... You know, we can understand things uh, in a way that, are, you know, doesn't put these things at odds with each other, but actually recognizes these they're, they're, these are two dimensions of of something that is is real. The <laughs> the very interesting thing about what you said about the both and um, is that what I what I observe a lot in my area is. Uh, a hands-off approach to the world by Christians, very hands-off uh, or overboard, which is to go completely into the progressive uh, right, right. movement, which is everything has to be hands-on. And we talk about doing things through a gospel lens, but we're really never actually bringing the gospel to bear in a hands-on way. Uh, because for a lot of people, the gospel is, oh, that's just that thing you hear so that you can be saved. And now you go out and you do a bunch of really good works and devoid of the gospel. And, and that brings me kind of this, what I saw in the, the war for the cosmos was that a, a proper view of piety, and, and that, that's huge because you know, you know this, people, you throw that word piety out. And, and you relate that very well in, in different ways throughout the book. You throw the word piety out there and everybody has this idea of 
you know, people sitting on poles <laughs> or uh, so holy that they're striving so much for holiness, which we should be striving for, that they don't take any action in the world. They, they, they isolate and become almost uh, cloistered monks, of, uh, if you will, and they don't do anything. And what I'm seeing throughout the book as I'm going through is, no, this kind of piety that, that, that you talk about and, and the, how important the household or that family structure is actually should stir you up to fight. Not, not necessarily, and maybe their place in some senses physically at times, but should stir you up to be engaged in the fight because the household dictates, should be dictating the direction that culture is going and am I wrong in perceiving it that way? <laughs> Is that what you were, one of the things you were pointing at? Well, it's definitely what I was pointing at. I think um, when we think about the cosmos, the, the Greek word cosmos means order. And what we have, uh, and often it's the, the word cosmos or cosmos is translated into the English word world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think because of that, we we can miss something that we sh shouldn't miss. And what I'm getting at is, is that there is a divinely ordered uh, sort of nature to things. And it's really not subject to our uh, revision. Uh, so, you know, for example, Christ and the church. Um, Christ and the church the relationship between Christ and the church is real. And, and it's not, uh, it's not the case that the apostle Paul sat around thinking about, well, what, what would be a great analogy or metaphor to sort of point to the, to the relationship between Christ and the church? Oh, I know, uh, you know, a, a, a groom and his bride. That's not how, how, to, how Paul thought about it. We can see that, uh, wasn't the way he thought about it, just by looking at, Ephesians closely. The way he thought about it is this. Uh, grooms and brides reflect an eternal reality, and that eternal reality is Christ in the church. So as we go about the work of living in our households as men and women, husbands and wives, we are participating in a larger reality. That larger reality is the relationship between Christ and the church. And because of that, we're not free to kind of just do this on our own or make up the rules as we go along. When we do that, we're actually uh, engaged in a kind of fantasy that doesn't have any substance. Uh, but when we participate in the, re the relationship that we see between Christ and the church and try to live out that, that reality, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, wives you know submit to your husbands and respect them when we when we live that out the way the way that we should we are participating in something bigger than ourselves something that's real yeah. and um that uh means that our households can tell the story or should tell the story of reality in the final sense the end of the world its purpose but also the way things really are now and uh, I think that so many of the nutty things that you see in the church today when it comes to households and families and egalitarianism and all this other kind of stuff is due to the fact that we don't really believe that the relationship between Christ and the church is fundamentally real and that it's the basis for our households. We think that it's just kind of like a cute little, you know, sort of illustration that Paul kind of dreamed up. But is no longer relevant to our situation today because of, you know, culture has changed and da, 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 da. That's nonsense. The Apostle Paul was not uh, just sort of arbitrarily making a choice and sort of glossing over certain cultural features. Uh, he was actually showing us that creation and new creation connect. Yeah, <laughs> like I, that's it. I'm, I'm we're done. Like, I, we, we don't even have to talk anymore. Oh. 
Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, as you can tell, I'm a politically incorrect sort of person, the kind of person that, that egalitarians just find scary. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there are soft complementarians who are scared <laughs> of you too. Yeah, um, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, that and you, and you also have a, a, a working relationship and a friendship with he who shall not be named. So, <laughs> Voldemort? <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, well, you know, it's funny thing. You know, I know you're talking about Doug. Uh, Doug and I are friends. And I've got a number of other friends that make Doug seem tame. And, and when people talk to you, me about... Are you sure we, you want to say that? <laughs> <laughs> when people talk to me about, you know, my controversial friend, Doug, I say, well, you know... Uh, Doug is not the most controversial friend I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I can talk about the other ones if you like, but anyway. But Doug, by the way, Doug is probably, I think, uh, he's misjudged. I mean, I, I, my wife and I have had dinner with him and, and Nancy, you know, half a dozen times. He's one of the most easy to get along with and uh, approachable people you'd ever want to meet. Yeah, everybody I know that's met him is like, why is everybody so scared of him? He's so right. down to earth. Um, I want to, how do I want to, it's not a transition as much. When you, when you talk about in, in your book, you talk about Aeneas and the loss of his wife and, uh, in, and she has this very moving, you know, this is very, very Mediterranean, you know, way of wives would speak in all of the the ancient literature. Uh, they're always that figure. It's never the figure that's holding the husband back. You know, it's always she's always inspiring him. You know, yeah, oh yeah, and yeah. and that's and that's what she does. She's dead, <laughs> and she's right, talking right. to him, and and she she compels Aeneas to fight. Right. Ultimately, she compels him to fight. Do you see what is happening in particular for the church in the United States, in the republic such as it is right now? Do you believe that if, if we were to recapture the household and the understanding of how important it is, that you we would see a revival of sorts not in the you know the the finiite kind of way but that right. a revival of sorts of people going out and saying like enough is enough the the world belongs to god and in a non you know actual militant way as as christian households we should be fighting to conquer the evils of the world because it matters to my home do right. you think that's yeah. do you think that is something that that we're missing today in the in the in the church in the context of the visible church? Yeah, I, I think we are. Um, I think in part it has to do with a way of thinking about relating to the world and the the the, the, the sense I get from a, you know most people who promote church growth is that we uh, have to attract people we, in, in ways that are culturally a, a sort of, a, uh, I guess, a palatable to people. So we can't um, say or do things that, uh, you know, just prim prima facie uh, could turn off a lot of folks. Um, we're we really do rely on a kind of marketing and sort of public relations approach to things that makes us the servants or makes us, you know, sort of a very vulnerable to um, the uh, opinions of people who don't know Christ. <laughs> so uh, we, we often, you know, censor ourselves uh, and water things down uh, so that we won't offend anybody. But I think that uh, there needs to be, we need to recover an apostolic confidence. That's a term that I was introduced to by a guy named George Hunter, who was a Methodist um, sort of a mission scholar. 
uh, and I heard him say that back in the late 80s, early 90s, and it, it just always stuck with me. And and uh, and what he was getting at is that we're not marketers. We're not people who are out there selling stuff that you know people are already looking for. What we are is uh, people who are boldly proclaiming the truth, and we're telling people things that they don't necessarily want to hear. And one of those things is this is reality, whether you like it or not, this yes. is reality. And if you fail to conform to reality, reality doesn't, uh, its feelings are not hurt one little bit. It just rolls right over you like a juggernaut and crushes you. And what we need to do is if we genuinely love people and if we genuinely have compassion for people, we got to stop giving them the impression that reality can conform to them and their desires. They need to conform to what is real. And if they don't, they will die. And, and so our work as, um, you know, evangelists, as preachers is to proclaim reality with a capital R uh, and call people to conform to it for their own good. And now I don't think that that's something that will be, you know, um, that will happen in the near term. Uh, and I don't think that it's something, uh, at least on a large scale. And I also don't think that even when we do see the church kind of coming along and doing that, the world will be all that pleased with <laughs> what, we, what we do and say. You mean they're not going to just jump on board and go, oh, wow, these Christians got it right. So that's right. That's right. No, I think that they I think they will double down on dumb and really come at us even harder. But if we play the long game, if we have a vision that is not just five years uh, or the next election cycle, but if we're thinking 50, 100 years down the road, you know, if we're thinking, if we're the kind of people who plant oak trees, you know, and and are, are doing what's right and knowing that it's our great grandchildren who will benefit, then we will find the courage to, to, to do the unpopular thing. Right. And so that, and to hear you say it that way, you know, and I have like so many about the, I, I did an essay last year uh, for the, my apologetics and, and evangelism side. And I talked about the, the use of the word nice. And it was funny because then you guys on uh, theology podcast ended up talking about it. And it was, it, it, this was all swirling around in my mind. So I guess I could do something mystical and say, God was trying to tell me something. Um, <laughs> but it, it, the church today, it has this idea that it's gotta be nice. And, and we define nice um, as in being pleasant. And really, ultimately, what we end up doing is what you guys talked about on, on the show was we end up being worthless, which is what nice really means. Yeah. Not, it, you know, kind of dressed up, gussied up, and, but really good for nothing. And that's what the church has become. And so now nobody, nobody knows how to fight anymore. We don't know how to fight, which yeah. is why we're losing denominations. <laughs> like. Right, right. Yeah, oh. it's it's a it's a fascinating word. If you do a little, uh, you know, sort of entomological research on the word "nice," you discover that it may, literally means stupid. Yeah, that stupid, good, you know, <laughs> like worthless, <laughs> just nothing. And like, right. And 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 what I run into today with with Christians who I'm aligning myself with that come from, and you know, you mentioned a Methodist. Like, I'm surprised that like, as soon as you said that you had took had taken some wisdom from a Methodist in the '80s that like the computer didn't catch on fire because we're not supposed <laughs> to be able to do that. But like I'm aligning myself with, with a, a broad array of Christians today who in this fight to take back our culture uh, still want to approach it in, in, in their ideas of being molded into the image of Christ, that somehow that means we, we can't be forceful in that we can't take these hard stands. And I'm I'm looking at the war for the cosmos and I'm saying, no, there are gonna be times where we as Christians, as we're fighting for our household, which isn't, and this is why I'm so glad you brought up the imagery of the three generations, which of course doesn't just stop with those three generations. What was being communicated there was that 
you have the older generation, you have the, the parental generation of, of the image of Aeneid and holding his son's hand. This, this stretches on in their minds. This goes on forever. This never ends. And we have to have that same vision, but we're not fighting that way. We're not fighting like it means that. And that's going to be, there are going to be times where it's a war, sometimes physically in, in, in a, in a, tangible physical sense and other times it's going to be strictly cultural and and spiritual but nobody wants to fight anymore because we're so wrapped up in what you were saying which is the marketing or being nice and, and wooing people and i'm like sometimes you have to conquer which right. of which of course eschatologically if for a lot of people in in the united states just doesn't make any sense because they're all waiting for the, the well the end times are here i just got to bide my time right right yeah, I think those are all great points. Do you uh, do you see? A, well, it, it's pretty safe bet you're either on mill or post mill. I'm really doubting that you're dispensational. Or, <laughs> right. yeah, or I'm, I'm go I'm ahead. Po I'm post mill. Sure. Yeah. Uh, do you? As we look around, what's happening right now? And there again, we're always there, there's always a fight. There's always a struggle. Um, do you do you believe that the harder the the progressives within the church and and either secular and even secular progressives, and quite frankly, I'm having a hard time looking at progressives and saying they're Christian anymore uh, because of what they what what they do with the scriptures. But do you see? the harder the progressives push within the church and the secular progressives push from the outside of the church. Do you see a resurgence coming soon of overall true Orthodox Christian um, beliefs kind of saying enough's enough and we're, we're taking back the culture. Do you see that happening or do you think that we're going to see a bigger shrinking away from that for in, in the near years? Well, I do see, I, I, I have a lot of uh, people who reach out to me uh, because of things I've written. So for that reason, I'm very hopeful in the sense that, you know, the th very things we've been talking about are things that resonate with a lot of, a lot of young guys. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, it seems to me that guys who were maybe younger than 35 are more open to these things. Um, kind of guys in their later thirties, forties, fifties have, you know, already kind of, you know, drunk the Kool-Aid as they used to say, mm -hmm. uh, they're just kind of committed to a particular way of doing things and they're just not going to change as far as I can see anyway. Um, but I do see a lot of younger men who uh, are, kind of, um, well, they're disillusioned with evangelicalism, broadly speaking, and that's a good thing. Because uh, well, uh, when you think about the word disillusionment, if you have an illusion, it really does need to be dissed. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so what you have is you, get, you have all these, you have this sort of illusion. Uh, you've had these illusions about how, you know, the church grows and how cultures are changed and da 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 da, da. and and a lot of younger guys are like oh, well that doesn't work that's nonsense that's you know crazy or whatever um now some young guys are completely on board with the whole progressive thing but i'm referring to guys who are obviously not a lot of these guys are guys who really do want to establish households and they want to have their households um uh, you know, reflect the reality that we were talking about before. So I'm encouraged by that. I don't have any illusions about things turning on a dime or anything like that. I think that there's a lot of momentum uh, already in play with certain, you know, movements within the church that uh, will take some time to play out. Um, what what things will be like 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I can't say, but I do think that if the, if the, the encouraging things that I'm seeing at the moment continue to grow and prosper, I think that 
those things could be at a really, you know, vital point by that time. So anyway, I've got, you know, a mixed, a set of mixed kind of feelings about, you know, kind of the situation that we're in. Um, on the one hand, as I noted, there are a lot of young guys out there that I'm connecting with that give me reasons to, to have hope. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that I just don't think is going to change and that, and we're going to see things kind of play out in a way that will, I think, lead to, um, well, things kind of petering out. Um, I think a lot of our Christian colleges were, are going to close in the next 50 years. Um, and we, and maybe uh, that's not a bad thing based on what's going on in some of those places. Um, I think a lot of churches that we now look to for sort of guidance and sort of as models of how to how to do it uh, are all going to be forgotten. Uh, you know, I give you an example. When I was uh, when I was a young man in the '80s, there was a guy named Robert Schuler. Oh, very familiar with, <laughs> with Robert. Right. Everybody wanted to be Robert Schuler. Everybody thought he was the greatest thing. He was the Tim Keller of his day. You know, everybody thought that he he had the model. Yep. <laughs> he, had a, he had a national television show. Everybody, everybody thought he was great. Anyway, I talk to young people today, and they don't even know who he is. Yeah. I'll, anybody younger than 30 years old, I say, uh, there was a guy named Robert Schuler, and they say, really? I had never heard of him. My prediction is that people like, uh, you know, John Piper, Piper and uh, Tim Keller and and uh, Mark Deaver, all these guys are going to be for, as forgotten as Robert Schuler. Really? So that's actually because I I cut my early Reformed Baptist teeth on 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 uh, Piper's tulip presentation and actually since you used the word, uh, quickly became disillusioned with him. Uh, yeah. I even took a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, Desiring God because I saw some things in there that were actually really good. And now I look at some of the Christian, the idea of Christian hedonism, and I go, I, I can see why that can be troublesome. <coughs> but uh, yeah, I guess I should say, you know, I painted with, I painted things with a pretty broad uh, oh, that's there. that's okay. I I just throw paint everywhere myself. So. <laughs> but I guess I guess my larger thought is is that um, um, we're yet to see what will kind of be the thing that God will do uh, that will bring about the kind of changes that I really believe God will eventually institute in our society. Um, yeah. We're under judgment right now, and I think that that judgment is going to take some time to play out. I'm glad to hear you say that we're under judgment. And well, that was that okay. Poor choice of words. Uh, <laughs> it's not that I'm glad to hear it. I'm I'm reassured that you're seeing it as well because I keep I keep running into people um, who are looking at what's going on. Let's just say in, in 2021. And they're like, Oh man, if we don't turn the direct turn course, we're going to, you know, God's going to judge us. And I'm like, eh, I really don't know that. Like, I believe we're actually under judgment right now. Yeah. I don't and, see how you can take a look at any, all the sexual insanity that we see around us and not say that's God's judgment. If you read Romans one, you know, that's the evidence of the judgment. Right. And everybody and everybody I talk to talk to says, well, that means judgment could come. And I'm like, no, like literally that means he's already judged us. Yeah. Right. right. And and then they're like, oh, so then he's returning. And I'm like, well, of course he's going to return. But I mean, that doesn't mean he's returning today. Right. And uh, I, I one, I don't want to keep you too long. I, I could keep you on here for quite a while, but you actually have a life <laughs> and, and writing projects <laughs> to do. Whereas I just have writing projects to pretend. And um. <laughs> It, I want to turn this a little bit, and ba not away from completely, but turn it a little bit to Christians now because we want to fight for our households. What, what does that look in, in, in you had also talked about being, you know, that, that leaning towards that paleo conservative um, ideal. Uh, and you've talked about it in different places, but um 
What does it look like for a paleo conservative household oriented Christian family, but especially the man, you know, the man of the house? Um, what does that look like today as we go out to engage culture? Because you can't have a household and not go out and engage culture. We see that all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Even when you read about the Proverbs 31 wife, it's not just about her. Right. Her husband sits in judgment at the gate. Right. He's engaging culture. He's making he's making decisions about things because of the strength of his household. What does it look like for someone who who wants to have that Christian biblical <clears throat> household view to go out and engage culture in that political sense today? Is there a place for Christians at the grassroots level to go out now and start affecting affecting culture down the road to turn culture around, uh, whether it be 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, is there a place for a Christian to do that? Should we be engaging in politics? Should we be engaging in local uh, affairs and at that level? And do we have to be nice to do that? Right. I, I think that um, the book that I wrote, Man of the House, uh, gets into a number of these very practical matters. I think that one of the ways that um, you do this is by acquiring productive property. When you are a, an owner of productive property, you play a role in your community that uh, people who lack productive property can't play. Um, now that means everything from you know owning real estate that's income producing to uh, owning businesses, uh, maybe intellectual property, whatever. Uh, what you have in a situation like that is, uh, you know, the, the, the really the, the you you find, you have the wherewithal to make a net contribution to your community. Because you're in a position to make a net contribution to your community, you're not a you're not a proletarian. You know, you're you know, in the ancient world, the term proletariat was a label for a freeman without property. That meant essentially the only way a person, you know, could survive was by selling his labor. Um, when that's the situation you find yourself in, you're very vulnerable uh, to yeah. the sort of the political forces that you that you have surrounding you. And really, uh, you know, the kind of dependency that we see in our society at so many levels is due to the fact that people are, they don't have, you know, they're not stakeholders in the community. They don't, they don't own anything. If you genuine, if you really are an owner, people look to you for leadership. People rely on you for work and they rely on you for your wisdom. And, you know, in my book, Man of the House, one of the things I, I, I stress is that when people, you know, want to bring about some kind of change, uh, people who don't own property or know anyone who does run into the street with a bunch of signs and throw rocks through windows. That's basically an admission that they are impotent, that they have no real leverage in their community. But when you actually possess connections, when you know people who uh, have authority when you yourself have authority, then uh, you can just pick up the phone <laughs> and say, "Hey, this is Chris. Hi, Bob. Uh, there's a thing going on down at the, the at the elementary school that really has some of us parents a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about it." Yep. That <laughs> that's that some tension. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So what we need is we need people who go out and start businesses, who, who own property, productive property in communities, and who are believers. And when that's the case, um, other people call you for help. Say, mm -hmm. hey, TC, you know, we got a situation here that's a real problem. Do you have any connections at City Hall? Do you know anybody? Uh, and when you do, uh, when you are the kind of guy that everybody in the community knows about and depends upon and his opinion, is, whose opinion is 
you know, got some weight, then you can make a real difference. So, um, yes, I think that, um, you know, politics, all these things are tremendously important, but I think that we need to enter into these, these sort of spheres of cultural uh, influence from positions of strength. And the way you do that is by building up uh, your household, by building up uh, your connection to other households. Um, you know, there are, and there are things that are going on right now that I think are very encouraging along this lines. I'm not in, in a position where I can actually talk about some of the stuff I know about, but uh, I That's do. That's all right. Once, once it breaks, then we'll have you back on. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. right. But there are, there are people out there who are, who are thinking along these lines. And I think, I think one of the problems that we have with Christians is that instead of thinking about these things deeply and, and sort of realistically, we end up just mimicking the nonsense of Antifa and so forth. And that, that they're not our model. They're morons. <laughs> they do the things they do because they're impotent. And the only way that they think they can get anything done is by threatening people and deplatforming mm -hmm. people and all that crap. What we need to do is we need to uh, build up our communities and build up our households and so that they have uh, weight in their communities. And if we right. do that, we are going to have more influence uh, than all those Antifa num numbskulls. And, and part of that is platforming people who are doing that, who are, who, who have businesses. It's, I'm, it's really kind of neat that you said that because I, I actually have on my website for uh, Minnesota Black Robe Regiment, I have a, a site page on there and I call it, you know, the patriotic small business owners. Yeah. But those I'm, guys are great. They're I'm important. trying, I'm trying to platform these people. We've got a lady here in Minnesota that just got booted out of a, a 17 plus year contract with a local co-op because she stood up as a business owner she makes paste. I don't know. I, she's a candidatory. You know, she makes candy, okay, <laughs> she, okay, and okay. and really good candy. You know, chocolates and stuff. And they booted her out of the of the co op. Her products out of the co op because she went to a council meeting as a local business owner with some clout, and stood up and said, uh, "I'm opposing our, our school board. I'm opposing." critical theory, critical race theory, because it's, it's wrong. Right. And they booted her out. And I'm like, Hey, I want to talk to you and let's platform you. Let's mm -hmm. platform you. Now I, I'm, I'm a little convicted now because I'm one of those uh, proletariat guys. I, I have, I have property, but I work, you know, a day to day job. Sure. But now I feel all inspired, Chris. So now I'm like <laughs> inspired yeah. and convicted and all not to figure out what I'm good at. Um, In the meantime, as people like me, you know, and, and I appreciate you keep saying young men, but I'm in that 50 and older age bracket. So I'm I'm just the oddball because I haven't drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, but as we look at these younger men, people who are working, you know, that nine to five job and they're living by working mm -hmm. for somebody else, as they start to, to look ahead in their own lives as a man of the household and, and as a household, and they maybe aren't in a place right this moment where they can be independent income generating people. Is there still a place for them to go out into the community and, and take their Christian values into the realm of what's happening in the culture and still be pushing to change the culture back to its the, the roots of how important the household is and bring God back into the mix? Can they still be out there doing that without that influence? Oh, sure. Yeah, I think that that's that's possible. And I think that they really ought to look for allies. I think uh, one of the one of the things that can happen is we get uh, some really um, courageous people who go out and die on hills all alone. And uh, they'll say, OK, I'm going to make this stand. And then they discover that there are a lot of people who give them a, some, you know, I guess, um, support in a kind of, uh, um, quiet way, but they, they kind of feel like they're all alone, kind of taking a lot of hits. 
I think that what we need to do is uh, work really hard at building coalitions and alliances uh, with uh, our fellow believers, you know, and, uh, you know, conservatives uh, and uh, stand up for each other like the, you, you're trying to do with this woman who's the candy maker. Because I think that um, if we can do that, if we can come to each other's aid, if we can organize uh, and know going into an encounter that, okay, these are the things that are going to, going to be likely to occur, uh, but we're going to do this anyway uh, because we have these plans to sort of follow up after, yeah. after this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you go to city council or to, you know, the Board of Education and you make some kind of public statement like this, like this woman made, well, uh, you've got a lot of people who will use you as kind of their, um, you know, um, sort of human sacrifice yep. to placate the gods of political correctness, uh, yeah. critical race theory or whatever. Now, what I, what I think happens too often is that people are surprised when that happens. I think that what we need is we be, compl <laughs> right, be completely, uh, you know, ready for it and say, okay, we know that when we go into this environment and we make this public stand, there are going to be all these people who are going to use us to sort of placate their false gods. Well, okay. Uh, what we're going to do is this and this and this afterward for this person. Um, we're going to try to take these people who have, who have, uh, made a, you know, sort of human sacrifice, uh, and, you know, out them for that. You know, there are just a range of things that you can do if you are organized, communicating, realistic, savvy, and, uh, committed to the long term. Uh, there will still be a lot of, you know, bloody noses and uh, people who, uh, you know, suffer um, for their convictions, but at least they won't suffer alone. And at least there'll be some follow up uh, that, uh, you know, we can see uh, play out. Anyway, so yes, the, the short answer to your question is yes, you can do stuff. But I can't, I can't strongly enough encourage you to do stuff with other people, right? Just die alone on a hill, right? Which actually, which uh, there again, I think just without, and I know you're, you haven't watched all of my stuff, but for, <laughs> but that's what I've been. It, I did not pay him to say this, people. I did not go, hey, Chris, I need you to say <laughs> these things. This is the natural <laughs> flow of the conversation. I've been saying this to people. We have to start standing together. And that means we might have to ally with the person who goes to a church that maybe I wouldn't necessarily attend. Right. Or who, right. who is Christian, but maybe has a slightly different theological perspective on certain types of doctrines than I personally do. And say, look, no, I'm not going to let you stand alone. I'm right. not going to let you. I'm going to stand with you. And I, I realize that one of us is probably going to suffer, but we're not going to suffer alone. I mean, th there's some place in a book somewhere it said that we're going to be hated for <laughs> right. Yeah. First, getting getting back to that point, just to finish on, you know, this point, you know, in the academy and in politics, uh, when it comes to the reformed, our best allies are the traditionalist Catholics. I can't stress that enough. They're the ones who are willing to go to the wall with us. Yep. Um, a lot of your mainstream evangelical megachurch friends aren't. They're bought into comfort. Yep. Because that's what their evangelicalism has taught them is that it that Christianity is about comfort. And it, well, and quite frankly, even a lot of the and and I love my pre-mill, I have I have a very good friend who I affectionately refer to as my token dispy. Um <laughs> he knows who I'm talking about. And I'll make sure I send this particular conversation to him to watch. Um 
that's been one of the weaknesses is that it's the the idea that that the the ship is sinking and there's no sense in in polishing the the brass on the sinking ship and and i'm like nah, mm, no god promised us victory and not in the seven mountains mandate dominionism way of of the that radical name it and claim it mentality but he's right. he's promised us he's promised us dominion through him mm -hmm. and and we're not supposed to be sitting here watching for the signs of the end times we're supposed to go out and engage and fight in culture which is precisely why we have found ourselves in the position that we're in and i don't care if you're a presbyterian a baptist a methodist a assemblies of god some nondescript com community church type we we are in the position we're in because we have abdicated the christian responsibility to the household to affect culture period and now people are starting to wake up and go, well, how do I make a difference? And and then we watch people sacrifice themselves and go, ooh, I don't want to be part of that. And I'm like, well, no, you should be. You should be. Uh, Chris, I want you to be able to, to go, and I appreciate your time. Uh, one, one person that you would point us to, of, of course, beside yourself, <laughs> to for sources of wisdom, um, that we can that we can look to read study today who's brought biblical perspective um to these kind of issues that maybe has inspired you or uh caused you to think or challenge some of your preconceived notions who's somebody that that my friends and and, and listeners could um turn to outside of your stuff as well sure well we've already mentioned doug wilson doug's a great yep. guy and uh, he cranks out stuff on a daily basis that just blows my mind how much he, he you know, produces. Another guy is Tony Esselin. Um, Tony is a traditionalist Catholic uh, who writes really well on family matters. And uh, his books, particularly on boyhood, are just great. So, uh, you know, he's a, he's a defender of traditional, sort of the traditional masculine virtues. Uh, so Tony's a great guy. Um, there are, you know, other people out there who I point people to on various subjects. You know, uh, you know, an example would be Alan C. Carlson. Alan uh, is an authority on really the traditional natural family, and it was the one of the uh, visionaries behind the International Organization for the Family, which sponsors, you know, huge. Um, rallies promoting the natural family in different parts of the world. He's he's a friend of mine, but he's also kind of you know an enemy of George Soros. George Soros does anything he can to harm him, which makes any him... enemy of George Soros is a friend of mine. So. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So Alan C. Carlson's a great guy. Uh, there's a good guy named Rory Groves who's written a book entitled Durable Trades, which is just a great you know sort of. Uh, practical handbook to get into, you know, some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, so those are some, those are some people I can, I can recommend. Well, that's amazing. And well, of course the theology podcast has a couple of other. Oh yeah. 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 Right. But, uh, uh, that, that's my way of, you know, clout chasing. So, <laughs> um, Chris, I really appreciate it. And, um, I, I can't, wait uh for, for your book on lovecraft and lewis because oh thank you. yeah yeah i i cut my teeth at a very young age on lovecraft and people are like uh what kind of psycho are you and i'm like <laughs> well i'm that kind of psycho and so when you even yesterday when you mentioned uh stephen king's reference to lovecraft and uh um, flannery o'connor yeah flannery o'connor um i was like this this guy is like you just constantly are throwing curveballs at me. Just I like I they're like he mentioned Stephen King. What kind of Christian can he be? And I'm like I so hey, thanks for your time. I will uh I'll, I'll kick you out and I'll I'll do a close and I will uh, send you a link to this when it's done. And um thanks for the the info. Thanks for the the kind of helping people to understand um how important the household is and i will make sure people know to where to find those books so great yeah th thanks dc i've enjoyed it it's been a fun conversation
Well, you know what? Thank you. That'll go down as I'm writing that down right now because <laughs> normally people are like, I, I got to go about two minutes <laughs> in. So thank you, uh, Chris. You have a great day and uh, God bless. Thanks. You too. Bye bye. Uh, bye. I cannot stress enough um, what you see in, in CR, what you see in Chris, is Christian humility, uh, but a passion to fight. And those things can go hand in hand. They, 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 can, they can intertwine. You can be down to earth and have the, the intellectual and philosophical uh, perspectives that men like Chris have. And, and align yourself with people who a lot of a lot of times, especially with an evangelical Christianity, people wouldn't even talk about. Uh, I like that he he referenced a, a traditionalist Catholic. I have a couple of friends, one in particular, who I would consider to be a traditionalist Catholic, who who's a dear friend, love him to death, love him to death. We we go to the mad on theology and doctrine, but like I know we're in the same fight. And and Eric, you know who you are. Um, now everybody else knows your first name, but uh, it's it, it's vitally important that we that we in this fight for culture we remember the household and how important it is, and which is why this channel exists. We we have to know why we're fighting, and if we're not fighting for the household, and I don't mean just like the place where you live, but your household, which is generational, it's generations. Then, then why fight? Then why fight? And God has ingrained that into us. He's He's built that into us. It's the same mentality that inspired the 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 men that became known as the preachers of the Black Robe Regiment. It and the laity of the Black Robe Regiment, because as I've said so many times, don't forget, the laity were also part of that Black Robe Regiment. They were out there in that war, literally in a war against uh, oppression against uh, tyrannical rule. And, and in our nation today, the church has got to wake up and understand that a lot of why we are where we are is a direct result of the fact that the church has been so silent and has been so hands-off cultural warfare. We've been so interested in only doing the easy thing or being, being nice, which, as Chris said, is just meant stupid or, or dumb. Like Jesus wasn't nice. The church doesn't have a history of being nice. The church doesn't have a history of complacency. That's that's a modern invention of Western church of the Western church, especially in the United States. I'm not here to win culture by being sweet and and and, and cloying and, and really cool to people. I'm here to win culture by fighting for the culture. In bringing Christian philosophy and Christian theology and, and, and to bear on culture. And I screw it up constantly. Like I say things I shouldn't say and I, and I do things that I shouldn't do. But it's a fight that we have to be engaged in. And sometimes that means taking hard stands and doing things that the, that the church would say, oh, I can't do that because they're going to think I'm a radical. They're going to think I'm weird. Who cares? Who cares what they think? Be the example. Fight for your household. I don't know what else to say other than thanks for watching. And like I said in the beginning, like, comment, and share. Check out Chris's stuff. Uh, I'll have links to his uh, website. And uh, listen to the Theology Podcast because it's phenomenal. You, you will grow exponentially uh, as a Christian and as a cultural warrior just listening to the guys there. Until next time. Six Semper, Tyrannus.